Hello, everyone, and welcome to Export Week and our session on how to finance and increase export sales and limit risks. My name is Brian Beams, and I am a member of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. Some housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone is asked to stay on mute if you are not speaking. Today's program is being recorded. The question and answer session will take place at the end of today's program. Feel welcome to type in your question at any time in the Q&A feature. We will begin Q&A. Uh, when we begin Q&A, please raise your hand and wait to be called. Uh, once our moderator acknowledges your raised hand, please unmute yourself and state your question. There is time to register for other Export Week sessions. You can view the list of all 18 events by visiting trade.gov. That, again, that's T-R-A-D-E dot G-O-V. Lastly, the views and opinions expressed during the, this program may not reflect the official policy and position of the U.S. government. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for today's session, Mr. Leslie Robertson, Vice President of TD Bank. Leslie? You're on mute. Mute. Uh, Leslie, you're on mute, sir. Sorry about that. Here we go. Thanks for joining us uh, for this conversational webinar on uh, how small businesses can finance and increase international sales while at the same time managing payment risks. My name is Leslie Robertson, TD Bank, and I'll be moderating the program, as was mentioned. Uh, it's a one-hour webinar, will be kind of informal, and will include a panel of export industry uh, specialists who will answer some key questions that small companies face when doing business internationally. Uh, I'm a commercial lender here at TD, and along with my international trade partners, work actively with our own clients and prospects to access these important export sales markets. So let's begin with some brief introductions from our panelists, and then we'll jump into the program. Melissa? Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this first webinar of Export Week. I'm Melissa Grosso. I'm the director of the U.S. Commercial Services Connecticut office. And really, I'm here to briefly set the stage for the overarching discussion of why exports matter and the federal assistance that's available to U.S. companies. Good morning. I'm Andrea Ratte. I'm a TD bank member, a trade finance specialist with the bank. We provide solutions to exporters to mitigate risk, support cash flow needs, and we are an EXIM delegated authority lender as well as an SBA lender. Really glad to be here at this kickoff Connecticut Export Week event. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jenny Norris. I am with Meridian Finance Group. We are a trade credit insurance broker. We are the largest broker for Exim Bank, as well as we offer credit insurance through all the private sector and I look forward to speaking with you later on today. Good morning, my name is uh, Richard Foy. I'm a regional director for Exim Bank. Responsibilities include New York up to Maine. Um, XM Bank is the official credit agent, export credit agency of the United States. Uh, our mission is to grow jobs through export, and we do that by reducing financial risks associated with exporting to ensure that exporters are not missing out on opportunities. Hey, good morning. My name is Joe Raycraft. I'm with the Small Business Administration. I'm the export finance manager for the New England region. And I am one of 22 export finance managers that the SBA has throughout the country. Um, my background is in international banking and trade finance. And with the SBA, my role is to promote the three SBA export financing programs through direct outreach to our SBA lender partners and to uh, small business exporters. As many as you may know, uh, SBA is not a direct lender but rather we offer loan guarantees to lenders for loans that small businesses apply for through their own banks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and look forward to uh, spending a little bit of time with you today. Good morning, I'm Denise Whitford. I'm a business advisor for the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. My um, focus is largely on helping entrepreneurs and small businesses get their businesses started and grow and the majority of that activity in regard to international trade is helping them do their assessments and move them forward into either new markets 
or uh, new to export opportunities. We're spread across the state of Connecticut. I am one of 20 advisors. And since COVID, uh, March of 2020, we've all been working remotely. Traditionally, however, we're focused in various chambers of commerce, economic development entities, and we also have an office at the Department of Economic and Community Development and the Department of Commerce in Middletown. Glad to be here today. Okay, um, so it's again back to Leslie Robertson here. Um, I ask you to turn to slide number three, if you uh, would please. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this particular slide just illustrates the interconnected nature, if you like, of how export activities and export finance kind of come together. Uh, with the U.S. Uh, small business exporter clearly in the middle of this, uh, promoting, facilitating, uh, and successfully exporting. Um, and that sales driving that sales activity. So that's that's the only thing. We, that's the only time we'll spend on this slide. Um, next slide, please. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, presenter, Melissa Grosso of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Melissa, as you walk through the slides, could you keep in mind a couple of key thoughts? One, um, as a company looking to increase my revenues, why should I consider uh, exporting. Uh, second, obviously, is what federal programs are available to help me do just that. And finally, uh, with overseas travel currently difficult right now, how can I identify and vet potential customers when I can't meet them face to face? Just some thoughts for you to consider as you go through the slides. Thanks. Certainly, and thanks so much again, Leslie, for participating and for the introduction. So to your first question about why a company should consider exporting, uh, really, it's pretty simple. It comes down to purchasing power. Uh, more than 70% of the world's purchasing power is located outside of the United States. So really diversifying your customer base is a key strategy for continued the continued growth of your business. Uh, next slide, please. And this is this is really where our organization comes into play. Uh, the U.S. Commercial Service is the federal government's trade promotion agency. So we work with companies across the U.S. to help those companies define and implement uh, their international business development strategy. And we do this through a global network of trade professionals who are located across the U.S. and around the world. Really what makes us unique is our worldwide presence of industry specialists who are situated at U.S. embassies and consulates in over 75 countries. You know, and, and with this, they have the local industry and country expertise to guide companies uh, to success. Next slide, please. And these are just some of the ways that we work with U.S. companies. So our U.S.-based staff works with U.S. companies to help your company, to help understand your company's products and services, your business model, your distribution chain, and other factors that are germane to your business. We provide technical counseling, uh, to in-depth market research reports, and then utilizing that worldwide network of, of industry specialists that I that I just mentioned, we provide business matchmaking uh, to help connect your business with potential partners and end users internationally. Uh, and finally, to, to Leslie, to your question about um, uh, vetting potential partners, one of the services that our organization provides uh, is a due diligence background check report on a potential international partner. So we have, with, with the onset of the pandemic, our organization shifted, we pivoted to virtual services. So we were still doing all of these things uh, in a virtual world. So please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, and I definitely encourage you to take a look at our website, which I've lift, listed here uh, on this page, which is really a robust resource for US companies. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So I, I would just, uh, my final slide is just to encourage you, if you have international related questions, I definitely encourage you to get in touch with your local U.S. Commercial Service Office. Uh, we have staff in 100 plus offices across the U.S. And those staff are really well connected in their local communities to other trade experts. And they really act as a central trade advisor to your firm. So again, definitely encourage you to go to this website and get in touch with your with your local US-based uh, US Export Assistance Center. And with that, I'm gonna turn things back to Leslie so we can get to the meat of the program uh, on trade finance, which is uh, a, a critical, critical component of a company's export strategy. Leslie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Melissa. That was excellent. And uh, we are truly blessed, honestly, to have uh, uh, the Middletown office uh, and under the malicious, Melissa's now leadership um, kind of supporting our, all of our efforts here. So thank you for all you do. Um, 
We'll go next over to uh, to Andrea Andrea Rete of uh, TD Bank. I think you will tell us, Andre, about several different tools that are available to exporters who you work with that answer the question. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And I'm um, very pleased to follow on uh, Melissa's presentation. Thank you, Melissa. U.S. Commercial Service is really a wonderful resource, no matter uh, where you sit in the United States, and I'm always pleased to to work with commercial service. Uh, so just starting maybe with the broad umbrella question, which is how do I make sure that I get paid? Uh, this slide has a lot of information on it. I do hope that you'll use it as a reference guide, um, something that you might refer back to when you are talking to your potential customers overseas. Uh, and then I would also encourage you to do talk to your bank about uh, any one of these products as a follow on and as you as your export sales get underway. Um, so the, we're going to start with the picture in the middle. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the sides. Um, the, this is really this. I call it a risk ladder. It's really the foundation of any export sale. Uh, it's really the foundation of any commercial transaction, too. If you think about it, um, we started the bookends, the advance payment and the open account. Um, you can see that there's an inverse relationship between the risk that the exporter takes and the risk that the importer or buyer takes, and they're diametrically opposed. So as an exporter, you're probably going to say, well, I want the most secure payment method. I want to be sure that I will get paid. I'm going to start with advanced payment. The issue there really is that if you're competing not only with U.S. exporters, but exporters around the world uh, who might be in the same industry, you might end up finding that you're not very competitive with an advanced payment uh, term, a uh, payment term. On the open account side, of course, as an exporter, you take the most risk because you might ship and not get paid. So the banks really look at the middle. How do we close the gap? How do we help companies close the gap to get comfortable? So I'll start quickly with commercial letters of credit just to highlight those. Um, that's really where the bank, your bank is, uh, or rather your buyer's bank is stepping in to your buyer's shoes and saying to you, the exporter, if the buyer doesn't pay, as long as you uh, meet the terms and conditions of the letter of credit, we, the issuing bank, will pay you. There's two reasons that this can help to make you more comfortable. One is um, uh, we do still live in a time when, uh, where, when buyers and sellers don't know each other or uh, aren't yet familiar with each other, uh, they feel like a bank can be a trusted partner. The other key reason for a letter to consider a, a letter of credit is because if you uh, the, a bank is t saying to you, exporter, that they are willing to undertake the credit risk of your buyer, and that should give some level of comfort that a bank is willing to underwrite your buyer. Uh, the the there are some other sort of details around letters of credit that we don't really have time to get into. There are some bills and whistles, bells and whistles that you can attach, uh, including LC confirmations, discounting time LC drafts if you find that you have to extend your terms under an LC. But they're a really uh, useful tool for managing the risk. Standby letters of credit can be used at the bookends uh, for either to secure an open account relationship or to secure an advance payment from your buyer to make them comfortable. And then documentary collections, I'll just close with that, is uh, really not a bank undertaking, but it's just a method of transferring title between seller and buyer using the banking channels, uh, but um, not with the undertaking of a bank. So. Uh, it is a way for an exporter to get your bill of lading over to your buyer and to ensure that the bank will, the overseas bank will collect your payment before releasing those documents. So hopefully this ladder has can illustrate for you how the banks can help you manage that payment risk. Thanks for your time. And, and Andrea, uh, Leslie here. So just in terms of how banks price 
these these products, these, the fees for the letters of credit, how does that work? Thanks for the question, Leslie. So um, for export letters of credit, it's really going to, to depend on what type of letter of credit you need and what country potentially it's from. Generally speaking, you're going to be looking at about an eighth to say about three sixteenth of a percent flat for an export LC. Overall, if you should require a confirmation of a letter of credit, which can come into play if you're not comfortable with the issuing bank risk or the country, um, then there will be additional uh, sort of a risk premium that you'll want to build in. Um, the last thing I'll say about this, Leslie, is it is important in that case to talk to your banker early to find out what those costs will be so that you, the exporter, can build them into your uh, pro forma invoice price. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's move on now to uh, to Jenny Norris of uh, Meridian Finance. Um, Jenny, a question I've heard uh, asked a lot is, you know, as a small business exporter, how can I protect myself from the risk of non-payment, particularly if I have to offer open account payment terms. Um, thanks. Uh, please go ahead, please. Jen, you want me to jump in? Yeah, Richard. Why don't, I think Richard's going to go first, and then I'll follow Richard. Yeah, I know we have uh, this slide's a little uh, a little out of order, perhaps. So uh, my name is Richard Foy, as I said before, Regional Director of uh, XM Bank. This is a pretty simple uh, slide, but I think it illustrates well you know, what it is XM Bank can do, um, you know, for the exporting community. It's important to understand that for the most part, XM sits behind, um, you know, the people. So in the case of TD Bank, uh, TD Bank may put out a working capital uh, loan for an exporter to produce or procure goods for export. XM Bank may guarantee that loan taking the risk out of uh, TD Bank's hands or helping mitigate the risk of non-payment from you, the exporter. Um, and then we move move on to after you sell the goods, and this is what um, was alluded to by, by Leslie, uh, when you sell the goods on open payment terms, as Andrea illustrated in the risk ladder, that can be uh, very risky when you sell on open payment terms. We help mitigate that risk by ensuring those receivables. It's important to understand now that how these things can work together. Um, so as you're exporting, you're in, in you're in uh, assuring your foreign receivables. Uh, so you have some some risk there. Balance sheet, you know, you have um, your balance sheet is growing, but it's also an asset now that you can go back to the bank and you can get an advance on those because now insured receivables are looked uh, kindly by the bank. So now this can help you continue to grow your operation because you have an insured receivable that the bank will loan on and you can fulfill new uh, new orders. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail because fortunately we have some other experts on the, the panel here. Jenny's going to uh, talk more about the specifics of export credit insurance. And then we're going to have Joe later on um, and myself talk about the actual working capital um, elements. So right now, I'll just turn it over to Jenny to take on. Thanks, Rich. Um, so I'm going to piggyback off of what Rich was talking about and go in a little bit of deeper dive as to what credit insurance is. And, and these are the benefits of credit insurance. Credit insurance is ensuring your accounts receivable. It is a risk management tool. Um, think about it with uh, this, this pandemic that we're in right now. Uh, if you had open account sales uh, during this past year, you may have been a little more worried about getting, getting paid on those. If you have credit insurance, we also call it sleep insurance, you have the, um, the confidence to know that those sales that you've made on open account terms will be collected if for some reason your, your client's not going to pay. So the risk management tool, we also call it the sleep insurance. Um, sales tool, think about this. As you are going out and making sales and trying to determine who you're going to be selling to, you may not know your customer on the other end. Having a credit insurer like Exim Bank or even some of the private credit insurance uh, carriers will help you make those decisions whether or not you should go ahead and sell on open account terms. 
So it really um, puts you in a competitive advantage because, again, imagine if you are trying to sell to a company and uh, your competitor is offering terms and you're a little worried and you're saying, well, I have to uh, sell cash in advance, you may lose that sale. And it may appear that your competitor is strong or larger or has more ability to provide terms when actually they could be used in credit insurance. So for sure, if you're out there selling internationally, at least understand what credit insurance is so that you can be um, potentially more competitive. Now, financing tool. This is going to be talked about uh, down the road as well in this presentation, but I think it's a very important point that a lot of exporters um, may not understand. When a when an exporter goes to a bank and is requesting um, financing, and they come to the bank and they say, "I want a five hundred thousand or a million dollars," the bank doesn't just throw that out there. The bank has a calculation that they use. And part of that is a percentage of your inventory. Part of that is a percentage of your receivables. If the bank sees that your receivables are open account receivables to anywhere overseas and they're not comfortable with that, they will pull that um, the amount that they're going to lend to you down. If you come back to them and say, hey, I've got credit insurance on my foreign receivables, well, you've effectively just strengthened one of your assets and and it actually makes you look better in front of the in front of the bank. So, again, credit insurance, uh, many benefits. We can certainly go into a lot more detail, not expensive and something that, again, if you're selling internationally, at least you should know about and, and it'll help you sell more internationally. Uh, I think, Leslie, I'm going to send it back to you. Thank you very much, um, and uh, uh, so we're delighted now to ha also have uh, Denise Whitford here with us from Connecticut Small Business Development Centers. Um, she's going to discuss export readiness strategies and, and planning, which I'm thinking, Denise, would come under the topic of how do I prepare myself for a discussion with my bank about export financing? Would that be right? That would be absolutely right, Leslie. Thank you so much for um, kicking that off that way. I'm wondering if we can go to the next slide right away. I think what we've heard so far from a lot of our guest speakers is uh, what you want to know and, and how you would want to get prepared. And the key role of the Small Business Development Center is to help you rationalize right through a lot of these questions. And as you can see on here, just like the Jeopardy board, there's a couple of categories that we start looking at. First of all, cash is king or should I say cash flow is king and so what a bank is generally going to want to look at is um, are, are does your business have the ability to demonstrate that you have a healthy amount of cash but also in comparison to your existing expenses so knowing how you sell your product who you sell it to and where that product is going is going to be really critical as we analyze some of those questions, we start to think about how you get paid from your overseas buyers and keeping in top of mind, what are those payment terms? How will that operate? So again, um, I think that a bank is also going to want to know um, how you cover your current debt, but also how you would bring on any additional debt. And as we're going to hear in a little bit, some of the options the SBA offers to help you get there. So along with maintaining a positive cash flow, um, having your debts under control is one of the biggest signs of a financially healthy company, but it's also a thorough understanding of your supply chain and your distribution channels. Um, a bank is going to want to know if you have a really good understanding of what your product and services are and how you get your supplies for the raw materials in and out of the U.S. Um, so we want to be able to make sure that you understand your customer base and their needs and their capabilities as well. In addition to that, um, lenders are, are, are going to also look at a couple of other things in terms of your revenue. Um, is this a large number of customers that you're working with or is it one or two customers with a large amount of activity? So again, a good sign of a healthy business is that in the eye of the lender that you really know um, your customers. And then also what happens if they drop you? As Jenny just indicated and Rich, how do you back that uh, that client up if you don't have XM in your side and you don't have the credit insurance? A bank is going to have a couple of questions there about how you're going to fill that gap. Additional questions might revolve around the credit worthiness again in the payment terms uh, from the time of purchase until that opportunity is delivered. And then, you know, the last thing that I want to touch on in this chart here of questions is, 
Um, when something does go wrong and you have a supply chain blip like we've had in the past year, maybe year and a half, what are your backup plans? Do you have a plan B or a plan C if your supply chain goes dead and you can't get the things that you need? That said, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the Connecticut Small Business Center, Center um, has a couple of different options and recommendations to help you offset and mitigate some of those things. And as you can see on this slide, we start off with a different type of assessment. And then we go into the strategic planning side to help you analyze and forecast as well as develop an action plan. But starting off with that assessment, I just want to touch on two quick things on the assessment. It really is an evaluation to look at the company's readiness whether you're new to export or you're expanding in that particular channel, we divide things up um, and look at them. Are you successful currently in the United States getting your product out there? And have you done export research in the markets that you want to penetrate? Do you understand what the risks are? Um, do you know what the tariff or the tariff barriers might be in moving into different countries? And then how is your freight forwarder working with you? Those are the kinds of questions that we want to assess to help you prepare best for that bank conversation. Once that survey or that questionnaire is finished, we start looking at other types of export readiness and, uh, and identify those needs to help you improve your activities. And that deeper dive is a further analysis. And that analysis, if you will, is going to be coming back to the bank questions. Um, that strategic development and exporting in different areas, if you're going into new markets, it's going to involve that deep dive and those wonderful projections that we always want to do. If we can move to the next and final slide for me. Um, as you can see on this spreadsheet, this is about financing. And many people say, I'm not very good at financing. And yet, at the same time, the bank wants to know, can you pay? Will you pay? And what if you don't? And this spreadsheet is a very simple tool for us to get you up to speed and, and confident about your operational and your financial questions. Um, for example, what happens if I have tremendous success? How will that impact my, um, my cash flow? How will it impact my inventory or even my product offering? Should I limit my product offering so I don't get into that kind of financial difficulty? Uh, what are my funding options? Should I do a, a line of credit? Should I do a working capital uh, loan? What are my options in those international markets? When we look at those considerations, we want to do those projections to look at your financial future and then how you'll manage that cash flow. And this bottom line tool is really a very valuable part of establishing your budget, managing your profits, and even your cash flow. So with that, I think I'm going to kick it back to you, Leslie. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, with us next is uh, Rich Foy again from Exim and Joe Raycraft from uh, the SBA. Um, I'm going to talk about the all important topics of working capital management, preservation, and financing that. And we all know that liquidity and working capital is a finite resource for all companies. Um, as an exporter, I guess I would be interested in what help is available to support my working capital needs and can I leverage my receivables and inventory related to those export orders that I, I traditionally cannot do with a domestic line of credit. Other questions too, but I'll let you guys jump in, okay? John, you want to start or? Uh, Rich, why don't you start? Joe, jo yeah, sure. Uh, so XM Bank, you know, we have right here on this slide, we have uh, on the, the left XM Bank's uh, program on the right, SBAs. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go over XM Bank's uh, program, what it does um, and, and what it, it can't do uh, for you as well. So again, it's designed to assist companies, mainly small and mid-sized companies, obtain working capital for the purposes of fulfilling export orders. So it's not meant for expansion. It's not meant for, you know, opening an overseas office or things of that nature. It's really designed to uh, execute on sales opportunities uh, immediately. So a line of credit is typically used to fund the acquisition of, uh, of goods that will be made into a product or uh, acquiring goods actually to be sold as, as is. We provide a guarantee to the lender of 90% uh, 
so in this case, uh, the lender is our customer, not the exporter directly. The exporter is the beneficiary of this um, of this guarantee, but um, but really the customer we're protecting here is the bank. While Exim Bank doesn't have a minimum or a maximum loan amount, uh, the determination as to which guarantee program a bank uses is at the sole discretion of the bank. So they will make a determination what fits, what guarantee uh, fits their portfolio best or where this uh, fits in their portfolio, I should say. Um, it's, we can use uh, export related inventory and export foreign receivables as collateral uh, on this loan. And one of the great benefits of this loan or line of credit um, when used with a, a bank is the collateral requirement. One, for a standby letter of credit, uh, we only will require 25% collateral. So this is great if you're receiving some advance uh, payment for goods um, or if you're going to manufacture a uh, product, you receive advance funds, you can park 25% uh, to collateralize the LC and then use the rest for uh, production. One limitation is that we cannot support defense-related exports or uh, sales to a defense-related um, uh, buyer. Those are some uh, uh, so, some of the restrictions that, that we have. Uh, Joel, I'll, I'll turn it over to you on your program. Sure, thanks, Rich. Um, appreciate it. And um, you know, the again, Joe Raycraft from the SBA Export Finance Manager for New England. So the SBA's Export Working Capital Program is, is very similar to, to Exim Banks. So I'm not going to reiterate um, everything that Rich just said. Um, you know, again, uh, Jenny hit on this, Denise hit on this, you know, cash is king, right? So if, if, if you've got a, a large order or an export order that you need to fill and you need working capital, usually it's a good idea to use somebody else's cash than your own. We all know how important liquidity is. Uh, so this is a great program for that. And as Jenny noted in Rich, um, you can monetize assets that are on your balance sheet currently. You can monetize those export receivables and exp export inventory for collateral purposes. Um, generally, uh, lenders do not conventionally offer export financing because they see there's too much risk associated with those assets. So. These are excellent programs to take advantage of. Um, again, Rich noted uh, the, the main difference between these programs is the loan amount. Uh, SBA can go up to five million, where Exim Bank is, you know, it's unlimited. So for uh, companies that have very large working capital needs, um, Exim Bank is typically a, a good uh, a good structure. Um, and also, um, the SBA is eligible for military and defense exports. And there's also no 51% content rule under the SBA's program. So there's some flexibility, a little different from Exim Bank, but I mean, overall, these are great programs to help companies with that ex export working capital component when it's necessary. Uh, Joe and, uh, and and Rich, can I just ask you one question? Um, say my business is a service provider, and I don't, and I sell internationally, but I don't obviously don't have any inventory, but I, you know, do require working capital to complete my work. Am I eligible also to for an export loan that would help me in that? Uh, Rich, do you want to talk from Ex Exim Bank perspective? Sure. From uh, Exim's uh, standpoint, we we do allow uh, some service related um, uh, exports under the working capital program. It is uh, fairly restrictive in terms of uh, you know what we can uh, support and and so on i believe the sba's program uh has a little bit more latitude in, in that regard um, but we've we can support uh some service related work sure. and I, we can move to the next slide um mm -hmm. so oh, so for service-based companies absolutely um there, there's sba's export express program um is a perfect option for service providers to you know, tend to have, you know, maybe not as large of working capital needs as, say, mm -hmm. a manufacturer. Um, so the ex the SBA Export Express uh, loans can be up to five hundred thousand uh, dollars. So, you know, rather than use your cash, um, an Export Express loan would be a, a perfect way to, um, you know, 
facilitate uh, the working capital necessary for um, you know a service type uh, type business. Um, you know we we all think of manufactured goods and product sales as exports, but services are a very big part of U.S. exports. And we're lucky enough today we're going to hear from another um, uh, exporter, exporter of the year for the state of Maine. And uh, Kathleen O'Haran is going to tell us about her experience uh, in a few minutes. Um, and just to kind of show you how how this um, you know is directly related to uh, service providers. Uh, with the Export Express program, it's it's very flexible, so it can provide both a working capital line of credit, but if there's also a need for some equipment, uh, we can structure deals that also have an equipment term loan component to them. Um, we really can finance any legitimate business need, so it's really you know talking to your lender, talking to them about your business, and you know what is the specific financing need that you're trying to uh, to cover. Leslie, I think you have another question for me, maybe. I do, and it's it's basically um, financing to support my business expansion, which is, you know, I'm looking to, to 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 move into overseas markets with my small business to develop and expand that export market. But am I am I able to obtain expansion financing even if I've not got an order just yet? Uh, yes, absolutely, you can, um, and that would be, you know, the the ideal program would be an international trade loan from the SBA, mm. and these are term loans that support the financing of, of more fixed assets, whether it be equipment, real estate, uh, permanent working capital to support uh, equipment purchases, or even for business acquisitions. With the international trade loan, there really is no uh, specific export sales threshold. So you may not even be exporting yet. However, you, you need to have a, a clear export plan in place with revenue projections for the next 12 months just to demonstrate to the bank that you intend to really attack the export market and again for an export plan highly recommend working with a small business development office like denise to help you put that together and and get the best plan possible um, to your banker so that they understand what your financing need is um, okay. with the international trade loan it's up to five million dollars so it's it's it can be a very large loan or it can be uh, you know on the smaller side so very flexible uh long-term financing program i had uh, one other question which was really um not so much on loan funding but grant funding um are there uh, grant grants programs available what are the qualifications and what sort of activities would be eligible for those uh yes and we can move to the next slide the um, so the SBA grant program it's it's referred to as a step program that um, is the state trade expansion program, which is a partnership between SBA and the individual U.S. states. And the purpose of the program is really to provide reimbursable grants to help small businesses or to provide incentive to small businesses to go global. And what that does is it, it will reimburse a small business exporter uh, for lots of different eligible expenses. You can see um, a few of them on the screen. Uh, some of the most common would be participation in overseas trade shows and trade missions, maybe product compliance testing, translations of websites, um, and even export training. Um, these can result in, every state is a little bit different, but they can result in reimbursable grants of up to, you know, 6,000, even up to maybe 15,000, depending on your state's program. So for more information about this, this is just a, a great program. I think it's one of the, the golden nuggets from this presentation. Um, I would, you know, recommend you go to the sba.gov slash step, and you can find your state's program manager where you can see the guidelines and application requirements. Thank you, Joe. Um, and I, I just want to just to uh, clarify, really, you know, on the SBA program, this more development, um, you know, overall 
helping you export um, more and getting uh, systems put in place and whatnot. And XM's uh, program is solely on fulfilling orders, uh, really, you know, not uh, capital uh, investments and, and so on. So those are two distinct um, things I just wanted to, to clarify between the two programs. Thank you. So this is a, I think, a good segue here to, I mentioned before, we have a, a success story we wanted to share with the participants, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Kathleen O'Haran from Jinx Productions. Um, her company was the 2019 main exporter of the year, and her business is a service provider uh, founded in 2005, and they operate in the media and film production industry, and they serve global clients. Um, Kathleen's company has taken advantage of both the STEP grant program and the export loans program. And uh, funny, Kathleen and I met on a webinar like this when Kathleen, um, as a participant, asked about um, export financing options. So with that, um, Leslie, I think you had a couple of questions for Kathleen. Yeah. Um Thanks, uh, thanks, Joe, and special thank you too. Before we go into this special treat at the end of the program here with Jinx Productions, but I want to thank uh, each of the participants on the on the panel. So thank you for that. Um, welcome, Kathleen. Uh, very interested to, to have you tell us a little bit about your company, um, how you got into exporting, and specifically which which export programs worked to help you the most expand your business overseas. So welcome again. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's a great treat. Um, I love any opportunity that I get to talk about my little company. Um, and um, let me, you know, start by just kind of explaining the work that we did when Jinx Production was founded in 2005. We were already exporters. Um, most of our clients that we started out with were based over in Germany. Um, and we produce uh, documentary content for television networks over in Germany to a German speaking audience. And that's kind of what we did when we got started. Um, we have a few clients over in the United States, um, but mostly we're working with um, television networks, but, and, um, you know, some international organizations uh, as well. Um, so really we've been exporting the entire time that uh, Jinx Productions has been in business. I never really thought of myself as an exporter until Maine recognized uh, my company uh, for exporting. <laughs> I was chasing Emmys and Oscars. I wasn't chasing um, SBA awards, so I was pleasantly surprised. And um, it gave me the opportunity to uh, interact with the SBA more. Um, and I met Joe and he introduced me to a few um, funding options. And so um, my... I wasn't really looking, obviously, to begin exporting, but I did want to diversify my client base, and I wanted to look at other German-speaking companies who might need some production support in the United States. Um, the cost of sending crews over here can be unsightly, and I wanted to make sure that companies were aware that we were over here, and if they needed any kind of production work done, that we would be able to answer their call. Um, so it was, you know, an outreach effort um, that really uh, I relied a lot on the step grants to help me fund uh, those outreach efforts to find a matchmaker over in Germany who could help me compile a list of potential targets and then come up with a PR strategy to be able to reach them. Um, I, I've relied on the step grants for a couple of years now, and they've been really great because I've been able to do some outreach and 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 develop a few strategies and not take on a ton of risk um, in case those things don't <laughs> don't work out. Um, you know, I, it's it, I'm not I'm not in the hole by too much, um, but it has been really great, enabling me to reach potential clients that I wouldn't otherwise have reached and we were able to translate our website and do some localization for our um, online footprint um, and get some name recognition through those. And then I was, um, the other um, loans that I wanted to talk about were the exporter express loans that I was able to take advantage of. Um, cash flow is king <laughs> for small businesses like ours. And we would run into these, um, 
it, it, it felt like bottlenecks where, um, you know, we had a lot of money that we were waiting on to come in from our clients who were not delinquent in payment, but, you know, it took a few reminders. Um, and so we would often have to float the, those costs, which prohibited us from, you know, taking on some bigger projects that we were really eager to do. And so, you know, the Export Express loans helped me to free up some of the cash flow in order to say yes to those projects and to uh, build up our equipment base whenever we needed to do that for larger projects. So it's been a real blessing for us and it's helped us to, both of those um, grant opportunities and the loan have um, you know, helped, helped me to think bigger about what my company can achieve and, and who we can service. That's, I mean, that's brilliantly inspiring. And um, do, I mean, obviously the, the, the learning curve for you obviously in these programs was, was huge. Did you find uh, when you had questions or you needed a further assistance, you got the, the kind of ha hands-on help that you needed? Oh, absolutely. Once I knew who to talk to, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and, you know, everybody was really good at pointing me to the right people with, to answer the right questions. Um, and, you know, it's, I've, I've had this amazing support system, um, you know, since my introduction to the SBA that I didn't really feel like I had before. Um, I, I don't come from a business background. I'm, you know, a very creative person who um, decided to open up a small creative services business. And um, it, it took me a while to understand that I had to run it like a business and not like a media shop. So once I did and I, and I was able to meet the right people, um, yeah, everybody's been very supportive and, and they know exactly who to direct my questions to, no matter how many questions I ask in a day. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, that's truly, we really do appreciate you being here because it's, uh, it's just uh, hands-on evidence of the fact that all of this, all of these pieces that can come together to make something work like this so successfully. So Absolutely. thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you for having me. Um, Brian or, uh, or Tony, go back to you. I mean, I've got some wrap-up things, but we've got some time for q and I think, from the audience, if we have those uh, queued up. Thank, thanks, Leslie. Um, I do have one, and if the panels, uh, panelists can see, or all the presenters can just uh, click over to the, our uh, Q&A session, they can kind of review some of these questions. Um, first, I, I think we're just opening it up for uh, Peter. Can you um, open up your line and ask the panel your question, sir? Sure. Peter Clement. I, um, I heard okay. a lot about, you know, cash is king, cash flow, liquidity. And I was just wondering if the panel partners with international contract companies uh, that may provide a non-recourse solution that may not have the minimum maximum requirements, the U.S. content requirements, or even the services requirements that some of you may have. Just curious to your thoughts on that. Can, can you repeat that question, please, on the factoring? Yeah, there are some international factoring companies out there that will transact internationally on a, a non-recourse, unsecured basis. Just curious to see if SBA or XM will partner with those factoring companies that don't necessarily compete because, for instance, you know, some may just do spot or, or transactional uh, financing. Um, so I, in my mind, not really a competitor, but potentially offering solutions to our respective clients uh, as a whole and not having some ineligible receivables that the SBA or, or Exum cannot service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, we do see typically um, a lot of the customers that we see are already in the process of, um, you know, selling the receivables or factoring the receivables. And, um, you know, they get to a point where they want to diversify their funding sources and they'll talk to us. So in, in a lot of situations, the company will continue maybe to factor certain receivables, but then other receivables are securing its export line of credit that it has with the SBA. So I think there is a way to, to work uh, together, uh, but that would be directly through the, uh, through the company. Yeah, and from my standpoint, um, you know, we always look for, 
you know, the benefit of the client. So we're constantly building out our network to understand what resources are available in the market because no two exporters are alike. So it's important to have uh, folks like you, uh, you know, available to perhaps refer a, a client uh, over to as appropriate. Thank you for your question, Peter. Um, moving on to Michael's question in regards to, Melissa, can you help um, just explain our due diligence um, package or service we have, our international company profile? Certainly, and, and Michael, I'm not sure if you had a, if there was a particular nuance to the question, but as Brian mentioned, our international company profile is um, sort, of, sort of a 360 perspective on a company, on an international company. So are my counterparts in, France or Brazil or in Taiwan will go and uh, meet with the company uh, post pandemic, of course, pre pandemic, post pandemic um, to get an understanding of the history of the company to make sure that they actually do exist where they say they exist. Uh, they will get financial background where that's feasible. Not every country, uh, depending on the transparency level of the country, not every country may allow uh, that information to be divulged, but where where possible, we, we can pull financials uh, for the company. And then probably most importantly, to kind of round out that service, uh, we will get uh, customer references for that international company, uh, for current customers uh, of that international uh, company. So again, it's it's a little bit more, it's, it's definitely more diverse than a traditional Dun & Bradstreet. Um, a lot of companies uh, sometimes use trace certification as well, although that's a, a much more involved process. But the international company profile, um, definitely well worth the the small amount of money that you would pay and, and that you could get step grant reimbursement for. Um, I, I would imagine that your company is doing its own vetting. Most companies have their own vetting, uh, internal vetting procedures, but this is a nice additional check uh, that, that U.S. companies often use uh, to ensure that the company that they may sign a, a contract with is on the up and up. So I hope that answers your question, Michael. If not, I'm happy to, to chat with you offline or, or um, if you want to unmute uh, and ask a, an additional yeah. question. I, I did unmute, Melissa. Um, it, what's the fee? Is it a small fee? Certainly. Uh, generally, all of our services for a small to medium sized company are under $1,000. If you're a small company, uh, it's a $700 fee for a full international company profile. So and and I will send. I think we can. I can drop it in the chat. It's it's in my presentation. I have I have a link for all of our virtual services, which include our our fee structure. And uh, Michael, Great, this is uh, Joe Raycraft from the SBA. I'll just add to that. Um, I have direct experience working with Melissa's office on these international company profile reports that are excellent. And you know they're again they're right around a thousand dollars. And Melissa, I'm sorry I forgot to mention that commerce. Uh, services can be used for the step grant. That's a, a very big part of it. And to me, these are um, these international company profile reports are excellent due diligence tools for exporters. Um, I mean, it's basically you have an U.S. embassy person knocking on the door of your potential overseas customer. So it really shows them that you're very serious about this and you want to get a background on the company. And you know, besides just the the report and the quality of it. Um, there's, you know, you can always have ongoing kind of Q&A with either Melissa's group in, in, in Middletown or even what I've found with the commerce folks overseas if you have a specific question related to the company. So there's a lot of value add in, in that uh, type of report. And um, uh, co a commercial finance company that I used to work with, we would use, that was part of our credit policy was to obtain that uh, that report. So I can't speak highly enough about that. Thanks, Joe. Th that's independent from what used to be called the Gold Key program. That's correct. We still we still offer the Gold Key program that falls under the bucket of of uh, the business matchmaking. Thank you, and Michael. I just dropped the link in the chat so you can go direct to, to our website to see all of our services. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your question. And Melissa, thank you for answering it. Uh, moving to Terrence has a question in regards for Andrea. Andrea, have you been able to review his question? Uh, it's really dealing with the cost associated with letters of credit and maybe some other minimum or maybe hidden cost. Can you uh, uh, note on that? Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Terrence, for your question. Um, in terms of the minimum, so I'd mentioned uh, in my remarks that the percentage is about, ends up being about three sixteenths of a percent, but if you really, or actually, yeah, about that. Um, if you look at the amounts and the minimums, Terrence, uh, to your point, an unconfirmed letter of credit, meaning an issuing bank is, issu is uh, just issuing the LC and the exporters bank is simply advising that on, um, that cost is about $350. Now, what do you get for that? You have uh, a bank that is receiving the message, the letter of credit via SWIFT. So there is a whole authentication process that the banks go through to ensure that none of the parties to the letter of credit are any on, on any OFAC lists. Uh, and uh, that generally speaking, the letter of credit is workable and essentially compliant with the uh, UCC. Uh, so, um, or UCP 600. So that's one consideration. In the situation where you have a confirmed LC, it's hard for me to comment directly without knowing what the country would be, the country of the issuing bank of the letter of credit. Uh, but in terms of minimums, the confirmation would add about $350 uh, on it as a minimum to a letter of credit. So that takes us to the last part of your question, which is, um, is there sort of a transaction minimum that I might uh, recommend? And, uh, you know, the transaction size might dictate whether you decide to get the LC confirmed or not. So that would be a decision the exporter would make. Um, depending on the transaction size. Usually I would say a letter of credit is best used for um, sales that are at least $20,000, uh, but certainly, you know, as you go up the scale to 50,000, 100,000, um, it's a very strong way to um, uh, sort of underwrite or uh, risk mitigate a single transaction. Um, the letters of credit are irrevocable, meaning the issuing bank cannot pull that away from you. And the same goes for an LC confirmation. If a bank confirms a letter of credit, uh, the confirming bank cannot just step back from that without getting certain permissions from uh, the exporter. So those are things to keep in mind as well. Thank hope you so that much. answers the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, question, for, I, I, I think I even know the answer to this, but I'll let Rich and Joe ask. Um, can funding be uh, obtained by a small business both at, at the same time or XM and SBA? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think um, I think it's yes. Um, we would just have to make sure that the collateral is is um, you know each bank or, or each program has its own distinct collateral package. Um, you know, so if a company has an export working capital uh, loan with um, with Exim Bank, um, it might be a transaction based or it might be um, asset based, where the receivables are the main collateral for that line of credit. Um, with the SBA, they could have maybe a small export express loan that could be used for um, you know some other working capital needs but it would have to have its own separate um, receivables and export inventory to secure that rich i don't know if you want to add to that yeah when i read it that's exactly the response that um, i had it, it largely is dependent on the collateral and how that's handled by you know by, by the bank we see a lot of uh, folks graduate from SBA or they outgrow their SBA facility because they have a cap of five million and then they need you know more so we, we move them into an XM uh, program. Typically it's with the same bank. So if you're looking at an XM you know facility either to replace or to have in conjunction with um, the SBA facility, it's probably the best idea to keep within the same bank because they'll be able to um, handle the collateral um, separation. Uh, it, it would be my statement there, yeah. Good point. All right, I appreciate everyone. That does conclude uh, all the time we have for our Q&A. Leslie, any closing remarks? Remarks, excuse me. 
Uh, yes, I'd just say uh, uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we enjoyed the conversation with you and I hope you found it uh, useful, interesting, and hopefully encouraging as you consider your own export opportunities. Um, thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to uh, Kathleen O'Heron for her inspiring story and all of you, the audience. And let us know if we can help you in any way. Goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone. This does conclude our